Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of April 15th, 2013. This week's case was sent from not too far away. This case was actually sent from right across town by one of my colleagues, Dr. Veronica Pei. Uh, Veronica was working at one of our community affiliate hospitals, and she had a 61-year-old guy that presented to the emergency department complaining of, oh, well, not a whole lot, just a couple of days of intermittent shortness of breath. He'd had some diaphoresis here and there, palpitations and lightheadedness. My understanding is that on the day that he arrived, he wasn't actually looking that bad, but his blood pressure was a little bit low, maybe in the 85 to 95 range or so, And but he didn't look that, that terrible. He didn't have any chest pain. He wasn't diaphoretic. He had maybe just a little bit of shortness of breath and just slightly lightheaded. Now, 61-year-old guy, he's not diabetic, but he still has a relative risk factor for atypical presentation in that he's, well, he's not a spring chicken. He's a little bit older and maybe not the best health in the world. So she got a 12 lead EKG on this 61 year old guy. And here is the 12 lead EKG. Now there's a few abnormalities that we'll walk through. First of all, you notice that there is sinus tachycardia and the heart rate is, I don't know, somewhere around 100 to 115 or so. That's not normal. Of course, he's not healthy. Maybe he's hypovolemic. We'll give some fluids. He's also got a bit of a leftward axis. He's got a downwards QRS complex in AVF. And we've talked about the differential for leftward axis before. You think about left bundle branch block, which is not present. You think about WPW, which is not present. You think about pacemaker, which is not present. Left anterior fascicular block, and we've gone through that before. I'm not going to spend time on that, but suffice to say that that's not present here either. And you also think about left ventricular hypertrophy, and that doesn't appear to be present. So there's just a left an uh, left axis deviation of uncertain cause. Maybe it's just a normal variant. We're not going to languish on, on that. What else do you have? Well, you've got poor R wave progression. Poor R wave progression is defined as an R wave in V3, which is less than three millimeters. Now, that's not always an acute abnormality. When you see poor R wave progression, R wave in V3 less than three millimeters, then the way that you interpret that is possible old anteroceptal MI. In other words, this patient has lost his R waves in the, um, the anteroceptal ease. And in fact, there's not much of an R wave out in V4 either. So maybe this guy has had a previous anteroceptal MI. We'll look for an old EKG to find out if that's new or old. But anyway, you can kind of look at that as a person having Q waves in V1, V2, V3. That suggests, it doesn't guarantee, but it suggests that he's had a previous anteroceptal infarct, but you don't really know whether that's new or not. The other major abnormality I think that probably everybody out there is noticing is that there are T-wave inversions. There's T-wave inversions in V1, V2, V3, V4. There's some flattening out in the other lateral leads. There's also T-wave flattening in, in lead two, and there's T-wave inversions in lead three and AVF. Now, if any of you have been longtime listeners or watchers of the video cast, you probably know the diagnosis already, right? But for those people that are relatively new, what we need to talk about is the significance of T-wave inversions. Now, when I was in residency, I learned that T-wave inversions equals cardiac ischemia. But when you see T-wave inversions, there's actually a differential of a lot of different things. You've got to think about cardiac, cardiac, there we go, Whoop. cardiac. But the other thing that oftentimes produces T-wave inversions is pulmonary disease. In fact, T-wave inversions are so common with pulmonary disease that they're well reported with pneumonia. Uh, I've, I re recall seeing a study where they just showed that uh, T-wave inversions can occur if you hyperventilate. If you just hyperventilate, you can induce some T-wave inversions. And in emergency medicine, when you see T-wave inversions and you're thinking pulmonary, you think about pul acute pulmonary hypertension. And this is something that Marriott described decades ago. And what he said, what Marriott, who's one of the gurus of electrocardiography, what he said is that anytime you look at an EKG and you're thinking inferior and anteroceptal ischemia, 
When you see T-wave inversions in the inferior and anterior septal leads, V1, V2, V3, in this case out to V4 also, anytime you're thinking inferior and anterior septal ischemia, the thought of acute pulmonary hypertension should jump into your brain. And in emergency medicine, acute pulmonary hypertension equals PE. All right, so T-wave inversions in the inferior and anterior septal leads together are very highly specific. Believe it or not, they're very highly specific with pulmonary embolism. Or if you can think of any other cause of acute pulmonary hypertension, then you can put that in there also. But in emergency medicine, again, acute pulmonary hypertension equals pulmonary embolism. And so uh, Dr. Pei saw these T-wave inversions in a guy who's also got tachycardia and shortness of breath, and she got a coronary, or rather a pulmonary CTA, and he had bilateral, very large PEs, and he also had right heart strain, and that's not surprising given that abnormality. So quick take-home points. This is a brief case, not that complicated at all, but here's the important takeaway point, and if you remember this, you'll save lives and you'll diagnose PEs on patients that sometimes you may not have otherwise been thinking PE. Large PEs very commonly produce T-wave inversions, and here's another important point I didn't put on this slide. When you see T-wave inversions, don't have tunnel vision and just think cardiac. Don't have tunnel vision and just think cardiac ischemia. Please remember that acute pulmonary disease, especially PEs, pulmonary hypertension, these can also produce T-wave inversions. So when you see T-wave inversions, don't just think cardiac. Think about the lungs as well. Now, there's various theories as to what may be causing this T-wave inversion. Some people have proposed that large PEs produce T-wave inversions because large PEs produce some degree of subendocardial ischemia, and maybe that's flipping the T-waves. Some people have suggested that when you have a large PE and it causes right-sided overload, right ventricular distension, the heart actually shifts its axis just a little bit and that may produce T1 inversions. I don't know. I don't care. I don't care what the pathophysiology is, to be honest with you. All I care about is the fact that we all have to remember that when you see T wave inversions, you should also think about PE. It's not uncommon at all, uh, EKG finding in large PEs. And in fact, uh, just to really hammer this home, there's some literature out there that actually indicates that T wave inversions are as common, if not more common, than sinus tachycardia in cases of large PE, believe that or not. And here's the other important point. And this is described by Marriott and it's been validated by some other authors in the literature, including a study that we did and published in Journal of Emergency Medicine just uh, about a year ago. When you see simultaneous T-wave inversions in the inferior plus the anterior septal leads together, as we see here, inferior and anterior septal leads together, when you see T-wave inversions in the inferior and anterior septal leads together, that is actually a PE until proven otherwise. In our study, we found that it was probably about 75% predictive of PE. And there's another study by Kasugi in American Journal of Cardiology published a couple years ago. And what they found was that if a patient had simultaneous T-wave inversion inferior plus the anterior septal leads together, that was about 99% predictive of PE. Incredible, right? So the first, second, and third things on your differential when you see this combination of T-wave inversions in the inferior and anterior septal leads together, that's a PE, folks. That's a PE until proven otherwise. So prove otherwise. If you want a lot more detail about the EKG manifestations of PE, just check out the podcast that we did on June 24th, 2012, where we went into a lot more detail and I showed you a lot more examples of PEs producing this particular T-wave abnormality pattern in the inferior and anterior septal leads. All right, so a really nice pearl to take home. I hope that's helpful and you'll pick up some PEs. I promise you, you will see PEs in the next few months or certainly in the next year that produce this particular pattern in almost always those are relatively large PEs. So I hope that was helpful, and I look forward to talking to you all next week. Bye for now.